Hey guys, welcome back for another video and today we're going to be looking at module 6 in Earth and Environmental Science. So, to start with, let's just go through to the correct page, here we are. So with module 6 we're starting to look at hazards that occur throughout our planet and primarily we're going to be focusing on earthquakes and volcanic activity. So to start with, we have to look at the ability to predict said events because as we know a pinch of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So in here we're able to correlate the causes of tectonic activity with natural disasters such as volcanoes, tsunamis and earthquakes. So on the map here we can see that the red triangles indicate volcanic activity quite easily. The grey dots indicate earthquake activity and the orange indicate hot spots where future events could occur. So to be clear, earthquake and volcanic activity occur mainly at plate boundaries. The reason why is because this is where most of the tectonic plates are shifting against one another and whether they're pulling apart, moving together or moving side by side, this build up in energy can be released in a sudden and very violent manner meaning the people that live on the areas where there's a gap or a change in plates could be more likely to suffer from volcanoes and earthquakes. So correlating that with what we know, let's have a look. So around the Pacific Ocean here, so it goes on the left hand side and also goes on the right hand side, we have the Pacific Plate and it's often referred to its edges as the Ring of Fire. Now this is because we can see if we trace this line around there are a large number of volcanic activity as well as earthquake activity. Now because of the size of the plate, any country bordering the Pacific Rim can be a risk. So we have Alaska and North America here, we're down to parts of Mexico, and down here we have the Andes and Chile. Now on the other side, we have countries such as North Eastern Russia, we have Japan, Southeast Asia, New Zealand, and all of these countries are known for having a large number of volcanic activities each year compared to other countries. Looking at Australia, for instance, we're in the center of the Indo-Australian plate, and as such, we have less likelihood of those things happening. But as you can see, we still have the occasional tremor caused by thinning within the crust. Relative plate movement stores energy that is released as earthquakes. If you want to get a basic idea of how an earthquake operates, take both of your fists and put them together so the knuckles interlock. Now, if you're trying to move your left hand down and your right hand up, it jumps over from one knuckle to another one. But it's not a smooth transition. This is what happens when it builds up potential energy for an earthquake. The two plates are catching against each other, and when they finally jump over and release the energy, it creates a shock wave, hence an earthquake we can measure. Volcanoes may occur at rifting zones, subduction zones, or hot spots. So anywhere where there's a chance that magma could reach the surface, volcanoes are likely to occur. All right. So an earthquake depth. Here we can see that earthquakes generally occur at different depths based on the type of earthquake that occur. So an upper plate earthquake has depth from 0 to 20 kilometers. For the most part, these earthquakes need to occur. They need a solid piece of matter to generate that shock wave. It's not necessarily going to work with a liquid per se. So with this subduction zone, we can have a large amount of solid material that's being pushed underground and it can break off and release shockwaves from there. So a deep earthquake, thrust earthquakes and intra-slab earthquakes are still entirely possible. However, if these two plates were going upwards, like when the formation of the Andes or the Himalayas occurred, then there's less likelihood for an earthquake to happen during that process. So if you'd like, have a look at the web link that's been provided there for you and have a read through the material. And it talks in great depth about how earthquake depth is in fact quite crucial when we're examining how the structure of our plate interrelates to this thinosphere below it. All right. 
Now, sadly, earthquakes cannot be predicted with great accuracy yet. I mean, we can easily track where an earthquake originated from, but we don't have an early warning system for it yet. Volcanoes are a lot easier because there's plenty of signs that we can see here. So, all types of plate boundaries can host shallow focus earthquakes, whereas subduction zone earthquakes can be deepest to 670 kilometers. It's pretty far down. The foci of an earthquake often occurs in the overrunning plate out of the subduction zone. However, the impacts of these earthquakes often include ground motion, liquefaction, landslides, and tsunamis. Liquefaction often occurs in waterlogged soils, like, while tsunamis can be caused by ocean floor earthquakes, asteroid strikes, eruption of volcanic islands, or underwater sediments. So, if you have small tremors that often precede a massive earthquake, then occasionally this can cause vibrations in waterlogged areas and cause things to sink. So, what we know is that if we vibrate particles very, very quickly, they can often start acting like a liquid. If you've seen Mark Rober's video on how he created a hot tub made of sand and he started vibrating it at an intense frequency, it became very fluid. Now, same thing can happen here, but it can destabilize something that's often weight bearing. So, for instance, if we have a very weak material that has heavy material on top and it starts to undergo liquefaction because of the vibrations, it can cause a massive landslide. So these are often the different types of sensing equipment that we can use to precede a tectonic event. The release of gases, so for instance volcanoes being able to emit more steam. Um, deformation, tiltometer, surveying, and GPS are often used on the sides of mountains in order to determine if it's changed shape at all. So for instance tiltometer accurately gauges the angle at which it's being held at. So this can tell us that, for instance, a mountain has begun to swell on one side where it's likely to release a large amount of volcanic material. Cameras, thermal imaging, and satellites are all great long distance and remote viewing pieces of equipment. Earthquake and lahar sensors are great for detecting ground vibrations. So we can't at this point predict if an earthquake is going to happen within the next month. We can, however, accurately gauge where it's occurring, or we can have an idea if a volcano is going to be erupting in the next few months or if it's becoming more active. So with developing new technologies, we're trying to ensure we can predict these events accurately in order to help more people and reduce the amount of destruction caused. If we knew that an earthquake was going to happen in, say, Mexico or in Guatemala or in Iceland, then we could evacuate a particular area rather than you know trying to evacuate it while it's occurring. Some of them, uh, yeah, we already know about that. Volcanic hazards. So, a divergent plate boundary, as we know, is when two plates are moving apart, and they're known for effusive eruptions and mafic magma. <gasps> Ooh. Where an oceanic plate is being subducted often result in explosive volcanic eruptions due to silicate magma creating high levels of gas. Okay, so... If we have two plates moving apart, the magma is going to slowly come out and ooze over the top as lava, and it's going to cool down as mafic material. However, if they're converging and one is being pushed under the other, then this can result in seawater being sucked down with it, and it can result in bubbles forming, making it very violent. And this superheated material is going to eject itself as often explosive volcanic eruptions. So the whole, you know, shooting fire and rocks and whatnot is not as common as we think. More often than not, it's a slow separation and oozing out of material. Love the word, ooze. Lava flows, while locally very destructive, are not the only issue to contend with. So if you live 20 kilometers away, and there's a lava flow that's occurring and it's going in complete direct opposite direction of your house and it's going to go straight to the ocean and there's no roads in the way, no no houses or anything like that. They'd warn people to stay away from it, but it wouldn't be a massive issue compared to something like ash falls or lahars. Ash falls are responsible for grounding a lot of air traffic. If you ever watched the movie Dante's Inferno, terrific film, go watch it. Ash falls are responsible for grounding most of the aircraft, so as such, you know, most people can't evacuate an area by helicopter or plane. This can be a serious issue, especially if you're in a remote location. 
Now, if the wind blows in a particular direction, this ash fall can cover massive areas. I mean, look at Europe. Several years ago, there was a, an eruption in Iceland that caused so much ash to be kicked up in the area that most of Western Europe air traffic had to be grounded as a result. A lahar is a mud flow mixture of volcanic material and water. It's considered very dangerous and lasts long after the eruption. So this lahar is essentially an impassable river of molten material, water, mud, and any debris it picks up. Most people believe that a tsunami is you know, just like a giant wave. You could ride a surfboard on it. What they forget is that wave is so long and carries so much water and weight with it, it can sweep out an entire city. In Bali, they had a, a massive tsunami probably over a decade ago. When it went in, it started collecting like cars and boats and everything else. And when it swept back out to sea, it took it with it. So as such, so many people who were deemed missing were believed to be lost or at sea or had perished. Now, if you tried to ride a surfboard to that event, you're likely to you know, get clipped by a car and then crush between two trucks. It's entirely possible. Now, volcanic gases are often as major part of volcanic eruptions as well because they're toxicity and acidity, depending upon what type of composition is happening inside the volcano. Again, many forms of media tend to over gloss this out because it's not as showy as a lava flow. But the release of toxic gases can result in altering the chemical composition of nearby water bodies. So for instance, it can make a lake incredibly acidic, or it could release flammable gases or incredibly toxic gases into nearby buildings or areas. Anyone trying to hide and escape from it could result in inhaling these gases and die. Now, here we have on the right-hand side a geo-worn early warning system. So, to start with, deterministic identification of volcanic precursors. So, they're looking for all the signs to indicate the volcano is becoming more active. Okay, anything that can indicate the size of the eruption, its duration, everything like that. Correlation analysis of precursors. They compare all that information to previous eruptions and they say, okay, it's very similar to this one, so maybe it will do the same thing again. This is similar to how meteorologists are able to predict the weather based on models that map previous existing weather phenomenon. They rate the correlations, so is it a 1, is it a 10, is it somewhere in between? And then finally, implementation to civil defense estimation of activity index. So in essence, they're trying to gauge what type of response they're going to give. Is it a full-blown evacuation? Is it just a warning state of this area? Do they need to perform an emergency explosive action on the side of the volcano and try and lance it so magma comes out at the side? Or do they just leave it alone and you know, ignore it? So as you can see here down the bottom, the blue and green often indicate very low risk. So blue, no risk in the near future. It's often with a dormant volcano, like Mount St. Helens. It's not active at the moment. It's not becoming more active, yada, yada. Hazard risk assessment analysis, no immediate risk. So essentially, we're saying that no one is going to lose property or life based on the activities of the volcano. Yellow is the only warning plan, meaning you need to get organized if you need to evacuate. Orange. Emergency plan is put into action. Red, it's already erupting. Now, here we have different magma types. I'm just going to move myself over here. So, the table in the top right hand corner has three different types of magma basaltic, andesitic, and rhyolitic. So, each one of these have a different viscosity, gas content, silica content, explosiveness, what have you. Viscosity, as we know, is how quickly a fluid can flow. So if you're comparing pouring honey out of a jar compared to pouring water out of a jar, the honey is going to take longer because it's more viscous. So basaltic magma has a low viscosity, means it flows very quickly. Rhyolitic flows very slowly. Now, while basaltic, material, basaltic magma has a very low viscosity and it's fast flowing, it's not very explosive. Okay, so there's a very low likelihood of being spat out and you know burning someone's house down. 
Rhyolitic material is very different. It has a huge amount of explosive material and often occurs in the continental crust. So if you have pyroclastic bombards, that's due to rhyolitic magma. Okay, it's very slow flowing, so it builds up pressure until it spits out a flaming chunk of rock. Which sounds pretty cool, but it's actually pretty horrifying. Now, in the bottom left-hand corner, we have a particular scenario where the eruption is not what caused a great loss of life. So, limnic eruption at Lake Neos in Cameroon. This was done in 1986. Now, what we can see here is the volcanic gases were seeping up through the Earth's magma. This does not mean that the volcano actually erupted, but rather it was releasing those toxic volcanic gases we spoke of earlier. It created a 50 meter thick CO2 river. Now, if you've ever seen a dry ice demonstration, you might see the container in front of you and there's steam coming out of the top. That is actually dry ice becoming a gas very quickly. And because it's heavier than air, it falls and immediately comes out of the container. So when this CO2 came out, it didn't go directly up into the atmosphere. It went down through the path of least resistance like a river would. Now, sadly, everything in its path from wildlife to livestock and even a small town were poisoned in their sleep because they were inhaling so much CO2. When people came in, you know, later on after the, this gas release occurred, they were very confused as to what actually caused it. And they started doing tests the volcano and realized, oh my God, this thing released toxic gas and killed people. Now, what we might also assume is that the lake that occurred here in the crater, which, you know, is pretty common, would also be incredibly acidic or more acidic than normal. If you were looking at, say, a, a can of soft drink, its pH is around about between five and six. So neutral is seven. Now CO2 only has a limited capability to make something more acidic. If I were to test that lake water, it would also be between five and six. But seeing as there's no pressure to keep it in the water, it gets released as a gas. All right, geological disasters. By definition, a geological disaster needs to cause significant damage to buildings and infrastructure before it's classified as a disaster. If it doesn't, then it's generally called a geological phenomenon. Okay, you know, something cool you might see on the news at the very last end for a puff piece. Effective government responses can keep geological hazards from becoming disasters, often being prepared for such disasters and putting in place management plans. So let's say we had two cities, city A and city B. Now, in between cities A and B, an earthquake occurred, causing a massive shock wave. City A had taken preparations in order to counteract the earthquake. They had struck, constructed buildings that were resistant to swaying and sudden shocks. People had been trained in an earthquake evacuation. They had drills, they had procedures and everything else. City B had none of these things. So while the earthquake might have caused some damage to City A, City B might be completely decimated. And while it's a geological disaster for both cities, City A got off a lot better because it was prepared and it was aware. So down the bottom here, we have part of the survey system. We have a base map, data collection, and GPS. So the base map is you know, a display, it shows the operation, shows measuring tools, data collection, graphics acquisition, attribute collection, graphic attributes editing. So essentially this survey system is trying to take all of the information we can about a geological disaster and it is compiling into something useful that people can use to help themselves. So for instance, there's no point in using a map if it's outdated, it doesn't show everything. There's no point in using uh, data unless you understand what it's telling you. And there's no point in using GPS unless it's accurate. Now on the right hand side here, global reported natural disasters by type from 1970 to 2019. So here we can see a variety of natural disasters. So volcanic activity, wildfires, landslides, earthquakes, extreme temperature, drought, Extreme weather and floods. 
Now what we can see here is there is a gradual increase in the natural disasters that occur and that can be due to all manner of factors. But one thing that they are attributing to is factors such as climate change which are causing more extreme weather phenomenon. Now geological activities such as earthquakes, tsunamis and volcanoes are not affected by this as such because they often involved in a different system. Just because it's been a sunny day for a long period of time, that doesn't mean we're more likely to get an earthquake. The two don't naturally correlate. Okay, But it does show that with an increase in natural disasters, we have to be more prepared and more wary of future plans if and when something like this happens. Okay, Volcanic impacts. I'll just move myself over again. So here we have a diagram of volcanic eruption actually occurring. So a big thing that people would take into account is the direction of the prevailing wind. Now let's, let's say this wind is going from east to west. All right. Any material that's being kicked out of the cone of the volcano is going to be blown over towards the west, meaning that if we had a town or an airport here, they'd have to ground everything and evacuate on foot. So an eruption cloud will have ash and acid rain. Remember that we have large amounts of volcanic gases mixing with water in the atmosphere. When it comes back down, it's going to be a different composition than what we have normally. It could be something that you know, causes extreme skin reactions. It could burn through different materials, depending upon what's present. Now, this also is going to create more solid material being ejected. So we have the eruption column here, but often we have pyroclastic bombs being released over here as well as a debris avalanche so any rock that's been shaken loose from the edge is going to be collapsing down the side of the volcano and it's going to take stuff with it pyroclastic flow is also going to be emitted as well because the stuff is denser the prevailing wind isn't going to be a big factor with it okay it might influence some of the lighter material but the heavier stuff is going to go where it wants to go now we can see that occasionally we have cracks that spurt outwards to the side. Over here we have fumaroles, which is a release of extreme pressurized gases mixing with groundwater. So it can be seen as steam that's being emitted out of the side of the volcano. If more steam is being emitted, it means there's more pressure building up. Now here on the left hand side we also have pyroclastic flow as well. Laha can be formed here, especially if we have a large amount of material that could form water and volcanic material up here, and the lava flow which just follows the side. All right, so that's a lot to go through. But let's have a look at some of the context. A volcanic eruption occurs when lava in the magma chamber of the volcano, along with gases such as sulfur dioxide, so rotten egg gas, is discharged with the volcanic event. Volcanoes are often classified based on the Volcanic Explosivity Index, or VEI, being categorized as either explosive or effusive types of volcanoes. If it's an explosive volcano, don't go anywhere near it. Get as far away as you can. If it's effusive, it's like the volcano activity you might see in Hawaii. Okay, It's a constant, steady flow of material, which is amazing to watch and well worth visiting. Magma flows, lahars, pyroclastic flows, and falling rocks and ash all have impacts on the biosphere. Meanwhile, ash and gases have severe impacts in the atmosphere when they enter the troposphere and stratosphere. Sulfur dioxide can form small amounts of sulfuric acid, which can freeze and form sulfur aerosols, impacting the hydrosphere's normal properties. So any other sphere within the region of volcanic eruption is going to be severely altered. Water sources will become acidified. Any plants and animals nearby might be destroyed. The atmosphere will slightly change composition. So it's a pretty big deal. All right, so here they've talked about it a little bit more as well. So physiochemical processing transport, radiant effects. Well, again, we can see exactly what we talked about earlier. All right, all of these factors here showing us that every sphere is being altered by this one sphere, this geosphere, creating such a magnificent reaction that it's shifting everything else out of its normal state of being. All right. 
volcanoes and climate. So, radiative forcing is anything that affects the solar radiation that reaches the Earth's surface. Both volcanic ash remaining in the lower stratosphere for a significant length of time, and sulfate aerosols in the upper stratosphere reflect solar radiation and lead to global cooling, often recorded in tree rings. So it's almost like how we're putting a sunshade or a sun cover in between us and the solar radiation. All right, much like how you would for your windshield inside your car to prevent your steering wheel from burning you. Now tree rings are great because the trees are going to be absorbing some of this material and it makes a very darkened ring. If you study dendrochronology at any point, you can notice that some trees might have a very darkened ring that indicate a volcanic eruption during that period. Volcanic eruptions release potent greenhouse gases which absorb infrared radiation and lead to global warming. So a volcanic eruption can cause either cooling or warming. It depends upon its composition. All right? No two volcanoes are exactly alike and as such, no two impacts that they have are exactly alike. All right, eruption impact case study. So you can look at various volcanoes throughout human history. More of the more recent ones include something such as Mount St. Helens or Mount Pinatuba, both of which had massive eruptions. I advise that you research one of them to have that case study in your back pocket in case you get asked that during the trial of the HSC. Okay. Climate disasters. Now in Australia, we have had a long history with various climate-based disasters, from fires to flood to drought and back again. Now because of this, a lot of people are involved in climate science in trying to ensure that these sort of things are either mitigated or we can try and counter them much more effectively. So looking at the map, we can see cyclones, extreme rainfalls, drought, heat wave, higher sea levels causing flooding, severe thunderstorms, it doesn't really end. But if we want to improve conditions, we have to understand what caused these events to occur in the first place. So the East Coast lows, which are intense low pressure systems off the East Coast of Australia, are more frequent in the cooler months, typically from May to September. It requires factors such as a low pressure system moving off the east coast of New South Wales and Queensland coast, with a high pressure system coming west from New Zealand. The effects of the east coast lows include strong winds, intense rainfalls, and huge waves. So, a low pressure system is where air pressure is incredibly low and it causes other atmospheric gases to rush in to fill the gap. Hence, the reason when they rush in, they condense rapidly and it causes storm activity. Now, if you're off the east coast of Australia and you have a very large low pressure system, while New Zealand's is a very high pressure system, it's going to move from east to west. And when it does that, it's going to keep moving west, making sure that everything on that coast is going to feel the effects. Bushfires, which are an aberration of naturally occurring fires, consume fuel and oxygen, killing native flora and fauna despite many native species of plants having evolved with standing or rely upon naturally occurring fires. Now, in recent times, the CSIRO has been working with Aboriginal elders and communities in order to try and understand a technique used called mosaic burning. For now, the RFS uses a large scale burn off in order to prevent fuel from burning up, building up. So that during the summer months where it's likely to catch fire and run, there is less fuel to cause a less severe event. So imagine, for instance, we have our field. Now this white indicates all of the fuel that's been building up inside of an area. Naturally, for you know the RFS, they think, okay, we're going to take this square two kilometers and we're going to burn all of that. Whereas the ancient knowledge taken from Aboriginal communities and you know Indigenous nations, First Nations, I should say, say, so, okay. We're going to burn off areas slowly over a long period of time. 
once those are burned, will burn others. So essentially, it's a slower checkerboard style pattern that only burns material if it's ready to be burnt. As we know, Australian plants and animals have evolved in order to withstand intense heat. Some forms of eucalypt trees require that intense heat in order for their seed pods to split open and they can germinate. Others, like the ironbark tree, are incredibly resistant to intense flames. But that was over periods of time where fires were a lot smaller and anything that was done was done through mosaic burning. Because of the situation of Australian towns and cities taking up large areas, people didn't want to do mosaic burning often because it was too close to them. So instead they did large scale burns less often. This results in more fuel being burnt up, being built up and then being burnt off more rapidly causing much more damage. Landslides, movement of earthen material due to a downslope due to gravity, can be induced due to land clearing, bushfires, road building, and other forms of building infrastructure. Since Australia is a relatively flat country, we don't have a lot of landslides. But if you go to the east coast, where we have the you know, Great Dividing Range, landslides there can occur, particularly if we've had a significant amount of rainfall and it undergoes you know, liquefaction in that area. Sinkholes can occur as well, but again, they're not a common occurrence. So as such, a lot of Australians aren't ready for an activity like that. Here we can see a various array of events, such as Hurricane Andrew, Ivan, Katrina, a Jap the Japanese earthquake slash tsunami, Hurricane Sandy, and geophysical events are down here in green. Up the side are the total number of events worldwide. Down the bottom, we have what year they occurred in. So dark blue is meteorological, blue hydrological, light blue climatological. So we can see here that there's been a gradual increase over time, even though geophysical events have stayed relatively similar. So it stands to reason that geological events are not the cause of this, but something else. I'll give you three guesses. All right, human impacted disasters. So this one I'm hoping to do with my class as a you know, whole activity where we post information regarding what we found about various natural disasters. You could go online, you could find a whole slew of the frequency of information on the frequency and magnitude of natural disasters. You could say, okay, worldwide they're improved, are they getting more common in Australia? They might be becoming less common, but it's up to you to do a bit of research. But my advice, make sure that what you're searching for is concise. You know exactly what to look for. So it might be you focus only on national floods in Australia. It might be you only focus on bushfires in New South Wales. Okay, make sure that you have your search parameters very concise because otherwise it will spiral out and out and out and out and out and then your eventual findings of statistical data will begin to skew. Oh, sorry, pun me. All right. Here we go. Predicting natural disasters. So. Volcanic eruptions can be monitored with the devices below to preempt an eruption. So a lot of these we already looked at earlier. Earthquakes are hard to predict with current technology. However, seismographs, GPS, and animal behavior have proven useful. There's the old story about, you know, dogs being able to detect an earthquake beforehand because they can hear it. Now, with the disaster types here, the prediction tasks we have to look at different aspects in order to determine whether or not that event is happening. So for instance, an earthquake, we have to predict the time, place, and magnitude of the earthquake. But with a cloudburst, we have to predict the cloudburst and predict the amount of rainfall that's going to occur. A landslide, we have to predict the landslide susceptible areas and whether or not that thing is going to occur. So as we can see here, the dark green is the natural events. 
If there were no humans on this planet, there wouldn't be any natural disasters. There would just be natural events. Now, if we have a high population density, then naturally these two are going to overlap with life and economic loss occurring. Hence, the red area is a disaster. So, to mitigate natural disasters, we look at prevention. So, construction of buildings have to follow building codes. If they don't meet the building code, it could mean that during a disaster, the building fails and it collapses. Innovations of new materials and technologies, such as movement dampeners, building isolation, structural reinforcement, flexible material. In Japan, they've used uh, bamboo and various pieces of technology to ensure that if a building won't crack when it moves, then it sways back and forward while still maintaining structural integrity. A location of the building and doing predictive models to see if a volcano erupted, where would the lava flow? Where would the laha go? And making sure that people don't build there. Japan's disaster education program is often done in schools, so they know exactly what to do during an earthquake or a tsunami because they're so often occurring. This table, I would invite you to get that down to your books because it's particularly useful. All right. Assessment weather mapping. So here we have a typical meteorological map. Each line indicates a differentiation in air pressure. So here we have two high pressure systems. We have another one here and a low pressure system over New Zealand. And down the bottom here, these this is our key for indicating different materials. So this low pressure trough that's occurring is going to be moving from west to east because things move from high to low. So what we can assume is that this cold front that's moving from the west is going to be going all the way over to New Zealand. Now, these warm fronts are often what precede an, a cyclone or a tropical storm or any sort of large amount of meteorological activity. So high pressure systems are very still. So what we can say here is in Australia, it's very low likely it's going to be raining. Tasmania might be getting some of it, but New Zealand might be getting rain within the next few days. So, weather forecasting has become accurate because of international cooperation, sophisticated computer modeling, and a variety of data inputs such as satellite imaging, which allows tracking of, loud, of cloud systems and large-scale systems, and radar, which provide detailed precipitation maps allowing storm tracking and local warnings. A lot of the time, scientists have to work with international standards. So say, for instance, we have this map of Australia. Okay, we use this system. If you went to Japan, or if you went to Indonesia, or if you went to South Africa, they would all use the same system because they have to be able to communicate with each other. There's no point in just looking at one piece of the puzzle and having to learn a whole new system in order to read it over there because what happens there might influence here and vice versa. Predictive models for weather patterns can vary based on their uses. Long-term client predictions allow infrastructure planning, so we know that you wouldn't build a very delicate high-rise in an area with high winds. Seasonal forecasts are used to plan water allocation, agriculture activity, and hazard reduction. We know that water rates are going to go up because there's going to be a drought coming. And weekly forecasts guide storm preparation and evacuation. Self-explanatory. All right, that's it for this topic. So what I'd like you to do now is to have a crack at these three questions. Have a go at either creating a summary page or a mind map or writing a report and then show it to either your teacher or someone else in your class and let's see if they can add anything to it or you can teach them something new. All right, that's it from me. As always, I've been Furry. You guys have been amazing. I'll see you around.